Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our service today. It is Sunday, April the 30th, our last Sunday in April. Where did the month go? My goodness. We are right in the middle of spring. We're getting all the rain over the last couple of days and the next couple of rain days for all of spring. So I hope you have an umbrella with you the next couple of days. Uh, my name is Brian. I'm the pastor here, and I just wanted to highlight a couple of announcements for you guys as we're getting started this morning. The first of these is our uh, our Christian Christianity Explored course. It's on Monday nights. We just started last week. We had our first week. Uh, this was um, just a really awesome start to our Christianity Explored st- uh, course. If it's something that you're not familiar with, it's an introduction to who the person and work of Jesus is. And if you're someone who's been a follower of Jesus for some time and you feel like you could brush up on on understanding what that is for your own personal discipleship purposes, you're allowed to come. If you're someone who's a friend or a neighbor and you've always wanted to know more about who Jesus is, you're invited to come. Basically, anybody's invited to come and allowed to come. If you wanted to jump in this Monday night at 6.30, you're allowed to come and join us if you want to still do that. And we have a great meal together. We have great discussion together. And um, I'm sure that we'll keep doing this because it's a a great work for us to be involved with as a church. We also have two more ladies' Bible studies in the book of Isaiah that are coming up. This is on the evenings of May 10th and May 24th at 7 o'clock at Lori Lee's home and Derek's home because he's here. I'm going to remember Derek as well too. And we also have a prayer night that's coming up Thursday, May 25th. Uh, This is going to be in the church office unless uh, one of us would like to host it in your home. Uh, to have us over to go talk to, uh, to, to God about the things that are going on in our church, things that we can take to him together. Uh, the church finds power when it prays. Uh, so please make sure that you join us for our prayer night coming up on Thursday, May the 25th. Well, we're going to look forward to having Christy lead us in worship, but before she comes up, I'm going to pray for us as we begin our morning service today. God, we thank you that when we go outside and we take a look at the beautiful blue skies, we can look up and be reminded that in the same way that the expanse of the sky stretches on and on seemingly forever, so does your love. And so does your care for us. God, today as we come to worship you, we are approaching a God who is a God of love, who is a God of faithfulness who is the God of care, who is an adopting God. And we all are weighed heavily with many things in our mind, many concerns that have weighed us down significantly through this week. We pray that we don't skate past them and ignore them, but actually we use this as an opportunity to affirm that your hands are strong enough to hold those burdens that we carry. So God, as we come to you, as we come worshiping you, grateful for who you are and all you are to us, we pray that we know that you're here, your spirit is here with us, guiding us, pointing us to Jesus as we revel and worship Jesus together. And for this, and in his name we pray, amen. Good morning. I want to read um, Psalm 36, verses 5 to 7 and verse 9. This is coming from the New Living Translation. Your unfailing love, O Lord, is as vast as the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches beyond the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains your justice like the ocean depths. You care for people and animals alike, O Lord. How precious is your unfailing love, O God. For you are the fountain of life, the light by which we see. So let's sing together. I'm going to invite you to stand these first two songs. Just really focus on the faithfulness of God. So let's sing that together. Why don't you stand with me? Yeah. 
Jesus, you have poured out grace. You brought me out of darkness. You have filled me with peace. Give earth mercy, oh my help in time of need. The word I can't shout but sing. Thank you. 
summer and winter and springtime and harvest sun moon and stars in their courses Let's pray before we begin this morning. God, we thank you that you are a God of faithfulness. And you're a God of forever faithfulness. Even though we wander, even though we go through times where we feel like you're not close to us, even though we go through times of pain and uncertainty, even though we go through difficult times and have a hard time finding where you are. God, in your word, you tell us you're much closer than we think. And Jesus himself reminds us that I will never leave you or forsake you. God, for the hurt, heart that's hurting this morning, we pray that you would remind them, speak peace into their heart, and remind them that you will never leave them or forsake them. And for the heart that's at peace, for the heart that's feeling joy today, we pray that 
you remind them too of the great faithfulness you extend to all of us. God, even this morning, I was thinking, what would it be like if we didn't have a God to call it to? We wouldn't know your faithfulness and your love. We wouldn't know your truth. We wouldn't know the peace that you give us in these uncertain times. So when we sing about your faithfulness, my goodness, yes, it is caps lock great as we think of it and remember it as it shapes us every day as your followers. God, we thank you that you are a faithful God. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everybody. Hope you're having a good day. It's the end of April. Um, I've noticed that um, something happened with the Leafs last night. Not important. Nothing important. Nothing important. There's a, there's a whole lot of debate surrounding that, and um, I guess in a lot of ways it's kind of like signing up for punishment, if, if you want to think of it that way, but. Just for fun, just for fun. Well, this morning we're, uh, we're going to keep going in our series that we've been going through the last couple of weeks called uh, Group Pictures. It's, it's a series that takes us through uh, the pictures in the Bible of what the church looks like from God's eyes. And this is an important series for us because these pictures unpack many surprises for us. And even more importantly, they tell us how we are to relate to each other and they instruct us and tell us how we are to relate to God. And they say a picture is worth a thousand words, and these pictures will help us and guide us to understand God and each other in a better way. Well, over the past couple of weeks, we've looked at two pictures already. We looked at the picture of the body. Let's say the body. body. Oh, okay, okay. Whoa, we had a little bit of lift at the end of the body, okay. <laughs> uh, we had the family. Hey, let's, let's all be honorary Italians for the morning and say, hey, family, my family, how you doing? Abundanza, beautiful, yes. Was that good? Was that no good? Oh, yeah, alla familia, yeah. <laughs> now, already both of these pictures have given us very different uh, understandings of who we are and who God is as we've started to look at these pictures. And the author Warren Wearsby once said, never get hung up on one Im image of the church. And so it's helpful for us to look at these different pictures of the church. And in one sense, you can almost treat it like your photo reel on your phone or like a photo album. And as we look at each picture, okay, it's going to tell us a little bit of something different about God. It's going to tell us a little something different about how God wants me to treat the rest of the people who are a part of his church. And when we begin talking about the church, we're not talking about the church as a building, uh, which is very often our default definition. We're talking about the church as the people. So the people who are on your right, the people who are on your left, we're talking about them as the church this morning. That's the church who we're talking about this morning. Well, this morning we're going to look at a picture of what the community of Jesus followers are to look like. And for some of us, it's going to surprise us a little bit. Uh, this comes to us from the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, if you want to turn there in your Bibles and in your devices this morning. In Ephesians 5, 31 to 32, it says this, For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ in the church. Today we come to the third image of the church. And the group picture that we are looking at today is the one that describes us as the church, as the bride. Now I had you guys talking a little bit at the beginning of the service. So our first point this morning is that the church is Jesus' bride. It's very interesting. I think we had a lot that we have to recover here, actually. We're going we're gonna to go through some of this to figure out how this has implications on us. But let's try that a little bit. Let's get that in our heads. Let's, let's get it out loud. So say to yourself, I'm the, bride. I'm the bride. Okay, now how did that feel? Did that feel 
really good, really affirming, or maybe that felt a little bit weird to say that or whatever. Yeah, it's not my immediate go-to picture, I guess, if we're talking about the community, right? Well, that's okay. The imagery of symbolism of marriage is applied to Christ in the body of believers known as the church. Now, the church is comprised of those who've trusted Jesus as their Savior and have received eternal life from him. God loves us and desires for us to be in relationship with him. And we start to understand this, we start to uncover this when we look at this idea of God's people, of followers of Jesus, as together being seen by God as not just a bride, but as his bride. It's very interesting. So just like the pictures of the church being like a human body and being like la familia, they challenge us and expand us to understanding our heart for the church. And so it does for us seeing ourselves as Jesus' bride. So pop question before we go any further. Do you remember your wedding day and how long ago was that? Okay, how long ago? Who, who's got the record? What do we got? Okay, can anyone beat 10 years? 56? John's the kid in class who just puts his hand up and he says, I'm going to win. <laughs> 56 years. That's amazing. And you guys are amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Or maybe you remember attending a loved one's happy wedding day. How did you feel? When you think back to that day, long time ago, even if it was a long time ago, it doesn't matter. You still remember how you felt that day, right? You still remember that being the, probably the fastest day of your life, right? Or maybe you think of a, a wedding that you've been for your loved ones or someone who you've been close to. And you just remember being moved by what you felt that day because of what you saw, because of what you heard, because of what you know that God designed that was placed in front of you that day. And that was a really powerful picture that you saw when you were at this wedding. At the wedding, what you see is you see this couple, this man, this woman, making a covenant of love. A covenant is an agreement of forever faithfulness to the other person, of love, of faithfulness, and commitment between two people. And you see the groom shifting nervously at the front of the church, front of the building, right? I've officiated a couple weddings too, which is a lot of fun. You're, you're just trying to make the guys just... Just don't pass out and don't ruin anything, okay? Then everything will be fine. The girls are kind of coming all synchronized. They all know what's going on. They've been, they've been making plans for this day, right? So this is fine. But the guys, you're just, just, just don't ruin it. It's, just, it's fine. So here you are. You're on this wedding day. He's moving around up, up front. And you're waiting for the opportunity. Everybody's there at the wedding to see the beautiful bride come up the row, walking. And it's like time stands still when the bride comes up and the music. We used to sing, Here Comes the Bride, and now we throw on Coldplay or Taylor Swift or whatever as the bride comes up the aisle, right? And when the bride comes up the aisle, what happens? Well, now everybody gets their phones out because everybody wants a picture. We all want video footage of this amazing moment that we're experiencing, right? They want to capture the moment. Other people, when the bride comes up the aisle, what are they doing? Watching the groom? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And the groom's either like, oh, she's so beautiful, or he's like trying to do everything he can within him to hold it together, right? There's no middle ground there. And the bride comes up the aisle. She's coming up, slow motion. People are smiling their faces off. They don't even know why. Other people are sobbing because they're like, that's the little girl that I saw grow up. Or that's the girl who's now a woman, and I've seen her go through all these different phases and journeys as a part of her life. You know, wedding is a very, very powerful thing. So when Jesus comes to us and he says, you guys are my people, you're my bride, poof, that's a big deal. That should give you goosebumps. And at the end of a wedding, there's laughter, there's joy, there's happiness, there's dance music. There's anticipation of two families being joined together, right? Wedding is a day 
of blessing. It's a day of honor. It's a day of beauty and gratitude and expectation. It's a joy to, to do weddings. I remember talking to one mom right after we had just uh, performed the ceremony, and she said, Brian, I, I've never really had this feeling in my life, but my cup is full because I just have so much gratitude right now in my life. Now think of these memories, think of these emotions. You've probably gone through this too, whether you've been in your own wedding or whether you've, maybe you've walked your own baby girl down the aisle too, right? There's a lot of emotion involved here. Now think of this picture that God gives us in his word, that the church is Jesus' bride. Ephesians 5.25 says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. So as a follower of Jesus, you are a part of Jesus' bride. Not somebody else, uh, not certain professional Christians over on this side, not certain people with certain aspects of a past that somehow worked out in their present, not certain people who have certain things going on on the outside, not the people who sit at the front as opposed to the to the backbenchers at a church, whatever, not the people who come to all the Bible studies and the people who can't make it to any of them, not to the people who've got all their life worked out, working pretty well on the outside. Jesus says, Paul says, Bible says, everybody. Everybody is part of the bride of Christ. Every believer of Jesus Christ is seen as his bride. And so as being part of Jesus' bride, you are someone who's on the receiving end of the love, of the forever faithfulness, and the commitment of God. Whoa. We could stop there. How does Jesus love the church? How does Jesus love you? Is essentially the question we're saying when we ask that. First thing we see is that Jesus gave himself for the church. We see this in Ephesians 5.25. Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. When Jesus looks at the people who consist of his church, he looks at you, he looks at us, and he says, I am ready to pay the price for these people. I'm ready to endure any pain for her collective good. He puts on hold all the joys that are his in heaven, And he loves the church when there's no love coming back. In Romans 5, Paul said, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He endured. He suffered. He forgave. He went through Good Friday so that we could all see and experience Easter Sunday. So as Paul ties all this together, this willingness to pay the price, this willingness to endure anything for her good, He then turns to husbands and says, in the same way that Jesus is willing to endure anything, in the same way that Jesus is willing to experience pain, in the same way that Jesus is willing to put the other first, now you as a husband, you go and do the same. Man, that is a really powerful picture of how Jesus suffers for the church. Jesus also leads the church. Ephesians 5.23 says, Christ is the head of the church, of which he is the Savior. Jesus takes the initiative with the church. He is always up to something good. Man, that is one of the things I have never gotten tired about with Jesus, is that he is always up to something good. He is always surprising. He's always showing up where you least expect him in conversations and relationships and in different places with different people. Every year I've ever lived and been in a church, people will always come to me and tell me, this person over here is completely impossible in my life towards me. And if you stick around long enough, very often God shows up and just decides, because he's like that, to do something in the heart of that impossible person. If you read the history of the church, you see the revivals, God sweeping into the church, bringing his people new blessings like they never imagined. So what will Jesus do? 
in the coming year? Where is he going to surprise you? Where is he going to surprise us? There isn't a single one of us who can answer that question. But you never know what Jesus is going to do next, which is why I was excited when we, not to promote our program, not to be a toot my own trumpet or whatever, but even just this past Monday, there's a small group of us at Christianity Explored, and I'm reminded about five minutes into it, okay, you're doing something here. And we're always surprised every time. Oh, wow, I guess Jesus really does want something to do with us and for us. Well, has a husband ever wanted to do something for his bride? Does a husband ever get joy out of serving his bride? Man, I do. So magnify that by infinity, and that's how God wants to do things for us. If he's the leader, if he's the head of the church, we need to follow the leader. If you break down what the New Testament tells us to do as a church, as you mark down the distinguishing marks of the church as things that it must do to call itself a church, it basically works itself down to five areas. You have teaching, you have preaching, you have the going out of God's word to his people, to his bride. If Jesus is our leader, he has a lot to say to us in his word. He has a lot that he wants to communicate to us through 66 books in which he wants to communicate to us what he has to say to us as his people. You have this area of service. If Jesus is telling us that we're to serve others, then that's something where we're going to participate in that as we're serving other people in the word that we're, world that we live in as well too. The third thing that the church is called to do is to be a people of fellowship. And why do we have fellowship? Why do we meet together? Why do we spend time together? Why do we love being around each other? Because of the picture we looked at a few weeks ago. We have fellowship with each other because we're family. And it doesn't matter what generation we are, whether we're young, whether we're old, we don't always have to keep hiving off these things separate from each other. But we're family, and families fellowship with each other and spend time together because Jesus has amazingly joined us together. Jesus has filled this room and given you a brother from another mother, if you want to think about it that way. We were talking about our evening of prayer that's coming up in a couple of weeks. Well, why do we pray? Because we have to? No. Well, think about what we talked about with the family the other week, too. We pray not because we have to or because it's something that we are supposed to do. We pray because we want to talk to Jesus, who's our big brother. And that carries with it the truth of what's expressed to us in Scripture, but it also helps us to understand the heart behind prayer as well, too. And why do we worship? Do I worship because I have to or because my parents elbowed me in church and they said, Brian, it's time to sing? Why do we sing? Well, as a mental health counselor and dating consultant, Samantha Burns knows a thing or two about successful relationship. And the self-proclaimed millennial love expert stands by her advice to wear your wedding dress wherever and when, whenever you want. Seriously. I've always been passionate about love and relationships, Burns told Today Magazine. They are what bring us so much joy in this world. For her, wearing the most special dress every anniversary is what will keep the romance alive. See what happens. It all started on the night of her wedding when Burns said she couldn't accept the idea of wearing her favorite gown only once in her life. That's when she turned to her husband and declared that she'd be donning her most beloved article of clothing every year on their August 10th anniversary. <laughs> he thought I was joking when I first told him, she said. When he surprised me with the trip for our first anniversary, I told him to make sure I'd be able to wear my dress to whatever we were doing. He laughed at me, but I brought the dress along with me. So on her first anniversary, she wore her wedding dress while hitting balls on the driving range. <laughs> on her third anniversary, she wore it on a sunset cruise on Boston Harbor. It was a Wednesday night, she said, so we had the dance floor to ourselves with live music. It felt like a mini wedding all over again. 
Like most brides and most grooms, too, Burns may discover she can't fit into her wedding clothes year after year. But Burns maintains that this isn't about her wedding dress capades. It's about couples cultivating their own traditions that make for a happy, everlasting union. Why do we worship? We worship because we're Jesus' bride. And we celebrate a memory of our affection for our Savior and how God has saved us with his, with his own love. That's why you worship. We worship as a response to the immeasurable love, goodness, and faithfulness of God. We don't worship him out of compulsion or because we have to. We worship him because he first loved us. So it's a response. So the third thing we see is that Jesus takes care of the church. Now, no technical language is used here. No jargon or loaded meanings that are difficult to unpack. It's very straightforward here if you see it here in Ephesians because Paul is actually talking to many people who don't really have a reference point for God. And so he says, I'm just going to give you this picture to try to help you understand who God is and who you are. Okay? And he says here in Ephesians 5.29, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it just as Christ does the church. Jesus calls his words to us and for us. He compares them to food for a reason. So when someone teaches you or someone preaches to you, that's your food. That's God's words coming to you. And so if you want to think of the pastor or the preacher or the teacher as the guy who cooks the food, hopefully it's a good tasting meal every week. My mom, when I was talking to her the other week, I said, Mom, how many meals do you think you made for us growing up? And she just started laughing. She said, you want me to come up with a number? I was like, dude, you guys are a bottomless pit. It was hard to feed a couple young boys. She said, I don't know. But you survived and you grew up strong. And so that's the goal that a pastor and preacher has. I don't know how many meals, how many sermons, how many messages we're coming up with. But we're bringing you food and hopefully out of it you grow up strong. Right? Through this word, Jesus nourishes his people. He protects the church. He builds up the church. And interestingly, the attention and the affection of Christ is always with the church. Jesus always knows exactly what we as the church, what we as his bride need. Um, the president of the school that I went to years ago, he would always wind up saying this phrase in just about every public address he gave. If you're around someone who, who has a phrase and they kind of wedge it into every conversation, you know kind of what it's like. You can see it coming a mile away. He used to say, I want to remind you today that, um, that God knows your address. He said, I know that you know that, but I want you to know that in your heart that God knows your address because your address is a personal thing. And I want to remind you that God is very well aware and he's paying attention to the struggles and the situations that are not just going on in somebody else's life, but your personal life as you're experiencing them and walking through that. And we know that's true because God knows your address. Just keep sliding it in there, right? But Jesus cares for the church. He cares for us in the same way that a husband wants to care for his wife. And interestingly, Paul also tells us in Ephesians 5 that Jesus will present the church to himself. This is interesting. The church may not always get along. The church as a bride might go through some experiences. It might go through some issues. It might go through some seasons. It might have some of us wandering for, for very long amounts of time. We might have difficulty listening to what Jesus is saying. We might be meandering all over the place. But what we're told is that Jesus will present the church to himself 
in the same way that a bride has prepared herself for her wedding day. Ephesians 5.27 says, Christ will present her to himself as a barely surviving, holding on church, as a radiant church, without stain, without wrinkle, or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. The author Michael Griffiths wrote a book about the church called Cinderella with Amnesia. That's a brilliant title. You remember the story of Cinderella, right? We all grew up in the 80s. We remember the story of Cinderella. Back when Disney movies were good. You remember this? Okay. This is right. She goes to the ball. She dances with the prince. His heart is captivated by her. But Cinderella has to leave before midnight or else, poof, back to the pumpkin, right? And she runs from the ballroom and one of her slippers falls off. And so the prince, who is so captivated by Cinderella, and he's so upset with himself because he didn't get any of her social media before he left, he tries to pursue her, runs after her because she is the woman that he loves. And he orders that the slipper be tried on the foot of every maiden in the land, and the one on whom the shoe fits is to be brought to the palace. And so now we see real-life Cinderella. She's sitting at home. She's dressed in rags. She's despised by her sisters, and she's oppressed by her stepmother. But her destiny is a love of life and love and joy and peace in the palace. Cinderella is a wonderful picture of the church. Sometimes she looks a little bit ragged. Sometimes there's ugly brothers and sisters who despise her and don't think that she matters. And in some parts of the world, a wicked stepmother even persecutes her. But Christ loves her because she's the church and will bring her to the palace, as we're told. Michael Griffith takes up this picture and he says, the church is often like Cinderella with amnesia. Our greatest problem is that we lose sight of our prince and of our glorious future. We need to remember who we are and to whom we belong. Christ has chosen a bride, and his bride is the church. And he has decided to include you into that church. He has decided to include you in his love, forever faithfulness, and commitment. That's an amazing thing. And you say, well, I've been in the church for a long time. And sometimes people say some crazy stuff. Sometimes people do some crazy stuff. Is Jesus really sure that he wants this bride? Paul reminds us in verse 27 that the church will be without stain, wrinkle, or any other blemish. So that means that there will be no zits on the bride's face on her wedding day. She won't be premature or immature. And there's no wrinkles either. Interesting. If the zits are the pain of youth, wrinkles are the pain of old age. They speak of tiredness, weariness, and carrying a heavy load. What does Jesus say? There's no wrinkles on my church. There's no wrinkles on my bride. She's perfect. Why? Because I made her that way. So how are you feeling today? You might feel like the zits are getting out of control a little bit. Maybe the wrinkles are. What does Jesus say? Nope. Perfect. Everybody okay with that? Just checking. The church, no matter what their history is like, no matter what difficult experiences they go through, and many churches do, which is why we need to remember this, no matter how people wander or do crazy things, at the end of the day, Jesus presents us to himself as a radiant and glorious church 
The word radiant expresses immeasurable light, immeasurable purity, off the charts. This is a picture of the church that I believe that desperately needs to be recovered in our time. So do we see the other members of our church as, ah, oh, that's blank? Or do you see that person as a part of being Jesus' bride? Do you see the goodness of God, the faithfulness of God, shine through in that other person? And even if you don't, if all you see is blemishes and mistakes, listen, how does the New Testament refer to the church when it's going through a hard time? He just starts calling them my beloved. My beloved. There's a lot of heart in that. That's in spite of wandering. That's in spite of not getting it right. That's in spite of messing up a whole lot. That's in spite of having a past. That's in spite of doing whatever in the present. Doesn't matter. That's Jesus' beloved you're talking to. At the end of the Bible, there's a great roar that comes from heaven, from Revelation 19. It says, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. What is heaven described as here? A boring get-together with some chubby angels and bagels? No. It's a wedding party. So get ready for it. Have you ever been to a wedding party? That's why you want to officiate them. Because wedding parties, oh man, are a lot of fun. Because it's a celebration of love and faithfulness and of God's goodness, all rolled up in one day. Jesus will present the church one day to himself. And those who love Jesus, you guys, will be referred to and remembered by as my beloved. So the thing for us that we want to think about is how are we to love the church? Jesus has chosen a bride, and a bride is the church. We are his body. We're his building. We're his family. We're his bride. There's all these amazing pictures. And if you really love the bridegroom, uh, you will love the bride. Ephesians 5, 31 to 32 says, A man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. There is a union between Jesus and those who love him that is like a union between a bride and a bridegroom. Because if you hurt the, the bride, you're no friend of the bridegroom. Every husband knows this, right? If someone's rude to your wife, what do you do? You just sit there and do nothing? No. That's, that's, a not, a, that's not a very good husband, right? If somebody insults the bride, the husband jumps up. And if you want to throw haymakers, that's up to you. Rick Warren had a good point a couple years ago. He said, you can't, tell to, you can't say to God, I love you, but I can't stand your wife. He says, the church is the bride. So you don't, you don't get to just stay at home and do Lone Ranger Christianity. It doesn't work that way. Why? Because that runs completely against the grain of the family. It runs completely against the grain of the household of God. It runs completely against the grain of the bride, it runs completely against the grain of the community of believers. And for a lot of us, this is a hard thing to sort it out, because in a lot of ways we think that this whole thing of Christianity is just about Jesus and me. I'm just going to roll over into this corner over here, read my Bible, and just kind of keep all these people over here away from me. 
One book that has always been referred to as a help for marriages, as a help for relationships, is by Dr. Gary Chapman. It's called The Five Love Languages. And some people love that book. Some people are kind of like, I'm not sure if I love that book, which is okay, because we, we can all have various thoughts on something. But one of the things that it does that expresses well that we can apply to the church is it talks about different ways to care for and love the other person that you're in a relationship with. And so it says, here's five things that you can do to care for your spouse or to care for the person that you're in a relationship with. Those five things are words of affirmation, quality time, thoughtful gifts, acts of service, and physical touch. So if you love someone and you're not sure how to take care of them or to understand which they resonate with the most, these five things can give you an idea of how you can keep the other person at the center of your universe, which is what marriage is meant to do. But we're not thinking necessarily about immediate marriages when we're thinking about this. We're thinking about the bride as the church and applying that to our relationships of people in the church. Let's think about words of affirmation. So how do we speak about the church? How do we speak about grindstone? Right? Do we speak of each other as loved family members, as brothers and sisters? Or do we speak about each other in different ways? Because what we say about someone is directly connected to our mindset about someone as well, too. Um, a few years ago, I was doing some uh, premarital counseling with a young couple, and I just asked them, as a discussion starter, as a bit of an icebreaker, what do you guys expect out of marriage? Because this always says a lot, right? This is, okay, this is understanding where we're going to go, what we need to work on. You're just trying to get a sense of where everybody is when you ask that question. Well, she was so excited to be married. She just loved this dude, and we were good. she was just so excited to be marrying him. They had this strong relationship. She couldn't wait to be taking steps on their new life together. And so what did he say? There were his expectations of marriage. And he said, well, dude, it's like this. And, and whenever somebody starts something off with, dude, it's like this, it, it never usually lands in a good spot. <laughs> so he said, yeah, you know what? I'm like her. I'm really excited to get married, and this is going to be good. But don't you just expect, Brian, that you know when you're going to get married to someone, that when you get home from work, they're always going to have dinner ready for you? And they're always going to have this done, that done, this done, bullet point, bullet point, bullet point, bullet point. Don't you just have that expectation? Usually when I tell that story, um, people boo the husband to be. Because the wiser and humbler crowd understand that marriage isn't about getting your checklist taken care of. Marriage is about serving the other person, right? And so I said to him, well, I think you just need to love your wife the way Christ loves his church. And uh, just put your checklist away. But it's interesting because um, I've been pastor here for a couple of years, and um, you wind up hearing a lot about people's checklists. Um, sometimes people come in and they say, "Well, Brian, I really like this, like this church. We really like how you talk, but um, you know, we have seven things that, that need to be filled out by the end of Friday." and I need this, 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 and this. And I've kind of been thinking about that, and I think it's, um, I think we have to be careful of that stuff because it's a bit of a consumeristic mindset that we place on the church. We don't need to think about having a checklist when we come into a church. 
Instead, we need to think about joining a family, joining a community, and joining some people that we can grow with and take care of. Another of the love languages is time. Um, if there's anything that defines our life in the golden horseshoe that we live in, it's these words, I'm too busy. Uh, every one of us is busy. Every one of us has uh, the same amount of time in a week. Uh, even had a guy a couple years ago who uh, lived in his parents' basement tell me that uh, he was too busy uh, for anything all the time. But we actually tell people with a great amount of pride, actually, I can't do that because I'm too busy. We, we take that as a good thing, right? Nobody messes around with that because we are uh, very busy with what's going on in our life. But some of us, um, you know, we have to be careful with this because if we think about applying love to the pride, um, we want to give words of affirmation to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, but we also want to spend time uh, with our brothers and sisters in Christ too. And Bill Hybels wrote a book a few years ago that had a very interesting title. He said, amongst professionals, we all say the same thing, that I'm too busy to pray. And so the end result of my life is that I don't pray. And so he flipped it on its lid and he said, we need to think differently about prayer Instead, now we need to think of ourselves as too busy not to pray. And so you start with prayer, and then everything else gets to follow after that. So what Paul's trying to get us to understand is that if we're to be people who are part of the bride, then encouraging the bride, spending time with the bride, um, providing for the bride, giving gifts to the bride, serving to the bride, these are all good things that can help us to take care of each other to take care of the church as it's placed in our hands for this time and responsibility. The last thing that it talks about is touch, um, which has been expressed as presence, not to kind of seem like it's taking a weird angle there. Presence for us in being in the bride, um, it's a difficult thing to do to have presence if we're only coming once a month. A few years ago, I had um, some parents ask me, do you think it's fine for us to have our kid playing sports and missing out on all things church and youth group? And I said, well, you guys have to come together and have a conversation as a family with how you're going to work out this time that you have. But the research shows, generally, that if you treat church like it's an unimportant thing to a kid, um, they're going to treat church like it's an unimportant thing as an adult, because it, it follows. And so if God is wanting us to give gifts to the church, to serve the church, and to have a presence in the church, then we also must prioritize our presence and time in the church. And so I'll let people work that out for themselves because that is their own personal conversation that they're having. But this is a way that we can show love to the people that Christ loves by attending, by our serving, by our giving of our time and abilities, and by our words. So ask yourself the question, I love the bridegroom, but do I love the bride? It's something that we all have to wrestle with but at the same time, it's a status that we're all very grateful for. This morning, we're going to be celebrating uh, the Lord's Supper. And it's interesting, thinking about it, how the bride language is there included in the Lord's Supper. It talks about God having a, a new covenant that he makes for us. And when we come to the Lord's Supper, we are celebrating the fact that Jesus has chosen a bride that Jesus has chosen a people, that we are those people, and he gives themselves to him by the work that he does on the cross. And so today, as we're going to take a few moments to be quiet before God, as we're going to take the Lord's Supper, I just want to invite you to take them up as you feel ready, as you feel led, and we'll say, take some time to ask God to speak to us. We'll take some time to say thank you, 
uh, for Jesus on the cross. And before we do that, I will pray for us as we prepare for communion. God, we thank you that you are a God who has a bride and that you've given your life so that we could know you and love you and have a relationship with you. This is no light love. This is no fly-by-night love. This is a forever love, a saving love that you hold out to us to receive and to enjoy forever. God, thank you that Jesus loved us enough to keep pressing towards the cross so that we could know you and love you forever. God, we pray today for the hearts of every person here who is a part of your bride. Help us to understand that you look at us with, word, with, with love and faithfulness and commitment. Not because we're good, not because we're bad, not because we're anything, but because Christ has died for us and made us his own. Lord, will you help us to live every day knowing that we are your beloved? Help us to live knowing that we're adopted kids. Help us to know that we're a brother and a sister to somebody. Help us to know that once we were lost, but now we've been brought in. It's all because that Jesus went to the cross for us. In his name, we praise you. We worship you. In Jesus' name. How great this love, oh, it's moving on my mountains, it's perfect love, it's casting out my fear. How great this love, oh, it welcomes me like family, and anywhere I go.
says in 1 Corinthians 11, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So let's take this bread together. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. So let's take this cup in remembrance of our big brother, Jesus. God, today we say thank you for Jesus' body, we say thank you for Jesus' blood, that all of it was given so that we could be free, so that we could be family. And we thank you, and we remember Jesus going to the cross so that he could make us his people. And so for this we say thank you, in Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Now that you're all standing, I feel like I'm at the end of a wedding, asking all of the guests to stand for here comes the bride. My prayer for you this week is that the Holy Spirit, in his good and gentle way, reminds you that you are much more than just a wedding guest. Collectively, you're the bride herself. And since we're at a family wedding right now, I'll end with a wedding prayer for all the beloved who are standing here. Lord, behold our family here assembled. We thank you for this place in which we dwell, for the love that unites us, for the peace accorded to us today, for the hope with which we expect tomorrow, for the health, the work, the food, and the bright skies that make our lives delightful. And for our friends in all parts of the earth, all God's people say together, amen. We hope that you have a wonderful week. We hope that you look in the mirror and remind yourself that I am the beloved. And we hope to see you again next Sunday. Have a great week, you guys.